So we're going to get started. Good evening and welcome. My name is Erica Zarzin, and I am the Public Awareness Coordinator for the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our Understanding Dementia community presentation featuring our guest presenter, Dr. Andrew Kirk, and made possible by Conexus Credit Union. Before we get started, I want to let you know the presentation is being recorded, but only the presenters will be shown on video, not the participants' videos or names. During the presentation, you can type your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we will have a question period at the end of the presentation. We ask that you please keep your questions relevant to the presentation, and if you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to our society staff at our resource centers across the province or by calling the Dementia Helpline at 1-877-949-4141. I will now share a land acknowledgement. Because the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan is a provincial wide organization, I would like to offer a land acknowledgement from a provincial perspective. The people of the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan are privileged to live and work across the traditionally sacred land we now know as Saskatchewan. We recognize the legacy and enduring presence of the Cree, Nakota, Dakota, Lakota, Sauto, Assiniboine, and Métis people, who are the original stewards of the rolling hills, rushing rivers, and living sky we all share today. As an organization, we acknowledge the harms of the past and how Indigenous people are still impacted by the process of colonization. Through education, partnerships, and collective action, we commit to honoring our relationship with the land, our treaties, and each other as we journey towards Wakohistoin, Wakotehistoin, sorry, or reconciliation. Sorry. <laughs> Next, I am pleased to introduce Selena Philpot, the CEO of Conexus Credit Union, to announce our partnership with Conexus. We welcome Conexus as our presenting sponsor for tonight's community presentation and want to commend their support to becoming a dementia-friendly financial institution to better support people living with dementia, their care partners, family, and our community. Thank you so much, Erica. Welcome, everyone. I am honored to be opening tonight's event representing Conexus Credit Union and sharing our excitement around this new partnership with the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan. I promise to keep my comments brief so that we can all learn more from Dr. Kirk this evening. Many of you are joining tonight's event because dementia has touched or impacted your life in some way. In fact, two out of three Canadians are impacted by dementia in some form. Bringing it closer to home, roughly 20,000 people are living with some form of dementia in Saskatchewan. It is time to create more complex, or sorry, or complete rather, networks of support for those living with dementia to ensure they and their families are better equipped to thrive in our communities. This shared vision is what led us to embark on this journey with the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan. Last week, we officially announced a three-year partnership where we have committed to contributing a total investment of $120,000 to developing the Dementia Friendly Communities Awareness Project. This project aims to increase the knowledge and understanding of those experiencing dementia by offering educational activities and resources to individuals and families in Saskatchewan who are living with dementia. Investing in basic human needs, including health services and education, as delivered through the Dementia Friendly Communities Awareness Project, is foundational to our purpose to improve the financial well being of our members and communities. Our research shows that fraud targeted towards seniors continues to grow every year, and those suffering from dementia are even more likely to be affected by these crimes. With this in mind, Conexus is working to establish an even more inclusive member experience to help further protect our members and to ensure they feel safe and cared for. We look forward to working with the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan to fill the current support gaps and help create a more enriching community for those living with dementia. Thank you and enjoy the evening of learning. 
Thank you, Selena. I know I speak on behalf of the Alzheimer's Society as we are very excited about our partnership and look forward to all the work that we are going to do in the community. I would now like to introduce to you Dr. Andrew Kirk. Andrew Kirk, MD, Fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Canada, is a professor of neurology at the University of Saskatchewan, where he's worked since 1991. His education was at the Western or the University of Western Ontario, where he also completed his neurology residence after studying internal medicine at the University of Toronto. Post-residency, he did research fellowships in cognitive neurology for three years at the University of Florida and the University of Western Ontario. In 2003, he co-founded a Canadian Institutes of Health Research funded rural and remote memory clinic and has also initiated a multidisciplinary clinic for persons with Huntington's <laughs> disease in Saskatchewan. For 16 years, he was head of neurology at the University of Saskatchewan, and for six years, he served as a board member at, of the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan and is a past president of the Canadian Neurological Sciences Federation and Canadian Neurological Society. He presented on his work to the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences and to the Senate of Canada. He's also a published fiction He's also published fiction in various journals and magazines, and he is a former residency program director at the University of Saskatchewan. He has a passion for education and has twice been nominated by the College of Medicine classes for the University of Saskatchewan Student Union Teaching Excellence Award. He received the Michael Wright Community Leadership Award from the Huntington Society of Canada, and in 2012, he was awarded the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal for his work in neurology. Welcome, Dr. Kirk. Thank you very much, Erica, and hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. It's nice to unfortunately not see you all. I wish I could, but I know you're out there. So let's go back a few thousand years to begin. This is a picture of Eos. She was the Greek goddess of the dawn. And a story was told about her that she fell in love with a young shepherd by the name of Tithonus. And she was a goddess, she was immortal, but she knew that Tithonus was mortal and would someday die. So she asked her father, who happened to be Zeus, it seems to be good to have friends in high places, I guess, if he could make Tithonus immortal. And Zeus agreed to this. Unfortunately, she didn't ask him to keep Tithonus young. And so while she stayed a young, beautiful goddess forever, Tithonus gradually became older, although he could never die. And when you read the Greek myth, it's apparent that he become, develops more and more physical problems, and then he develops problems with thinking and memory. And she looks after him for a long time, but eventually it becomes too much even for a goddess. And there are two different endings to this myth. In one of them, she puts him in a cave and leaves him there babbling endlessly words with no meaning. And she rolls a big rock in the mouth of the cave. And in the other one, she changes him into a grasshopper. And neither of those are, are very considered very good therapies nowadays. But I think it shows us that even 3,000 years ago, the Greeks knew that it was hard even for a goddess to care for someone with a dementia. Now, let's fast forward to 1901, and this is a woman by the name of Augusta Detmer, and she's only in her early 50s when this picture was taken, although she looks considerably older, and she was having trouble with her memory. Her husband found that she was forgetful, she was repeating herself, she was losing things, she was having trouble doing the housework, and um, she was accusing him of having affairs, and she was up at night, and this was bothering the neighbors downstairs from their apartment. And so he took her to see this man, Dr. Alois Alzheimer, and he examined her in a way very similar to the way we examine people nowadays. And there's a transcript of, um, of when he examined her, and at one point she starts saying, I have lost myself, I have lost myself. Now, five years later, when she passed away, this isn't actually her brain on the right, but it just shows you what the brain of someone with this illness looks like. So on the left, we have a healthy human brain. On the right, we have the brain of someone with advanced Alzheimer's disease. And you can see how shrunken the brain is. 
And when Dr. Alzheimer's looked under the microscope, he saw in the upper left, you can see these sort of blobs here, and those are amyloid plaques. And then these kind of dark comma shaped things, those are neurofibrillary tangles. And these are the hallmarks of what came to be known as Alzheimer's disease. And so she was the first person diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease so well over a hundred years ago. Dementia has a, a terrible emotional cost and personal cost. Even if we just look at the, the money cost, the monetary cost of dementia, it's estimated, and these are figures from 2015, they've only gotten worse, that in 2015, $818 billion US was spent on the care of people with dementia worldwide. So if that were the GDP of a country, if dementia was a nation, it would have the 18th largest economy in the world. It would be between the Netherlands and Turkey. So that's pretty staggering. So even if we look at it on a purely monetary basis, this is a very expensive disease, not even to say anything of the, the cost um, emotionally to individuals. So what we're gonna talk about tonight is some of the different types of dementia, some risk factors for dementia, warning signs of dementia, the importance of an early diagnosis and some of the programs and services offered by the Alzheimer's Society. So this is an introduction to dementia. It's not an, a, an advanced program. It's, it's something that I hope everyone can get something out of. How common is dementia? Well, the Canadian study of health and aging showed that one in 12 people over the age of 65 has some form of dementia. And a pretty staggering one in three people over the age of 85 has some form of dementia. So that, that's a lot of people. And there are certainly people under the age of 65 that we see with dementia as well. What is dementia? Well, dementia is a problem with cognition, with cognitive skills. So things like memory, calculation, language. And it also, as well as affecting thinking, it also affects emotions in many people. Dementia is the overall term for this condition. And then there are different types of dementia, just like we might use the overall term pneumonia. And then there are different types of pneumonia. Some people have a, a strep pneumonia. Some people have a COVID pneumonia. There's viral, bacterial, fungal pneumonias. Well, it's the same with dementia. Dementia is the overall term. And then we have different types. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. Frontotemporal dementia is another one, vascular dementia, Lewy body disease, and mixed dementia. And we'll talk about each of these as, as we go through them this evening. What causes dementia? Well, that's a complicated question. The one thing that's important to say that dementia is not a normal part of aging. I mean, there used to be this thought that, oh, well, she's 85 and she's getting forgetful. That's just, that's just normal aging. Well, it's not. We do... As we age, our memory is not as good at 85 as it is at 25, uh, and that can be a normal change, but dementia is not normal. This is an illness that's uh, superimposed on normal aging. And, and just to give you some idea, this is a cross section of the brain. It's as if we've cut through someone's head like this, and we're looking at it from the front. And on the left side, you see a normal, healthy brain, and you see the part of, parts of the brain that are important for language and the parts of the brain that are important for memory. And then on the right side, you see a, a cross-section through the other side of a brain of someone with Alzheimer's disease. And so you can see that there's a lot of shrinkage of the brain, as in that actual brain I showed you earlier. You can see the language parts of the brain are very shrunken compared to the other side, and so are the memory parts of the brain. So the brain itself is smaller, the fluid filled space in the middle, that's the ventricle, you can see it's gotten bigger because the brain itself, itself has shrunk. This is a, a nice colorful picture of a brain and it just shows what different parts of the brain are important for. So down at the bottom in yellow, we see the temporal lobes. This is a part of the brain that's very important for memory and it's also important in understanding language. 
at the front of the brain, the big pink area, the largest lobe of the brain is the frontal lobe. And in large part, this is the part of the brain that makes us human. So this is important for executive functions, things like planning, organizing, problem solving. You know, I've got four emails I have to reply to at work today, but I also have to go to this meeting. And when am I going to get those things done? Those are the kind of things we rely on our frontal lobes for to organize us. They're also important for emotions and for behavioral control and personality. So, you know, if you see, if you're in a restaurant and you see something that looks really tasty on someone else's plate, you don't just think, oh, that looks tasty and take it off their plate and eat it. Your frontal lobes tell you, no, that's not something you should do. If you're two years old, you might do that. But by the time we're adults, our frontal lobes have developed and we know we shouldn't do things like that. Um, just behind, at the back part of the frontal lobe, in that sort of brownish color, we have the motor cortex. And this is the part of the brain that has to do with movement for the, the other side of the body. <clears throat> and right be behind that, in an orange color, we have the sensory cortex, which is important for feeling for the other side of the body. Those parts tend to be pretty much spared in most forms of dementia. So they tend not to be so involved. The temporal lobe that I talked about is very heavily involved in Alzheimer's disease. The frontal lobe is very heavily involved in frontotemporal dementia. In green, we have the parietal lobe, which is also affected in Alzheimer's disease. And it's a part of the brain that, that puts together our perceptions. So things that we see and feel and hear, you know, we, we hear a, a barking sound and we see this four-legged animal and our parietal lobe puts that together and says, oh, that's a dog. It kind of makes sense of the world. It's also important for arithmetic and for spelling. And then at the back in blue, we have the occipital lobe and that has to do with vision. That's where we, all the information from our eyes goes to and we put it together and, and we see it. And then we send it off to other parts of the brain like the, the parietal lobe to make sense of it all, the temporal lobe because of memories about what we're seeing and so on. So those are the parts of the brain um, that we see. What are some causes of dementia? Well, we, we talked about cognition, meaning thinking, memory, things like that. And so there are some acute, that is sudden reversible causes of of problems with cognition. And those could be things like medication effects or a combination of medications that are having a, an unpleasant or unfortunate interaction. Uh, if someone has an infection that can make them um, more uh, confused, depression can sometimes affect people's attention and memory and things like that. Things like dehydration or stress, tumors of the brain, vitamin deficiencies. And I could go on and on with this list. There are lots of things that can cause what we often call a delirium. That is an acute, sudden change. Most dementias are not an acute, sudden change. They're things that come on gradually over time. But these things on the left are sudden things. And sometimes when a person presents to a hospital and they're confused, the, the nurses and the doctors in the hospital might think, especially if it's an older person, oh, this person has dementia. So if you're in that position and it's your family member and this person was perfectly fine until three days ago when he got a fever or something like that, make it very clear to the medical staff that no, he doesn't have dementia. He was fine until three days ago, he got sick and now he's confused. Um, of course, people with dementia are also susceptible to delirium. So when someone with Alzheimer's disease gets an infection, they can become more confused when they're in hospital. And just this afternoon, I, I saw a gentleman where, where that was the case. On the right side, we've got a list of the slowly developing chronic and largely irreversible causes of cognitive impairment. So those involve the types of dementia I mentioned, Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, frontotemporal dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies. In Parkinson's disease, we can see cognitive problems as well. Alcohol takes its toll on the brain, especially in excess. And, and we just saw uh, last week or the week before, uh, that we have new alcohol uh, intake guidelines for Canada. So it used to be 
for men, two drinks, no more than two drinks a day, 14 drinks a week. For women, no more than two drinks a day or nine drinks in a week. It's now two drinks a week is the maximum recommended intake of alcohol. So things have really changed. It's been recognized that alcohol causes a lot more problems, even at lower doses than we used to think. And then acquired brain injury. So obviously a brain injury isn't something that comes on gradually. It, it, you know, the person has an injury to their brain and then have cognitive problems afterwards. So let's talk a little bit about Alzheimer's disease. It's a progressive illness. That is, it gets worse over time. So it often starts very gradually with a bit of forgetfulness. And as time goes by, it gets worse. It's a degenerative disease. And what we mean by degenerative is that brain cells are degenerating or breaking down over time. And that's why the brain is shrinking, because the individual nerve cells are breaking down. And it's irreversible. Alzheimer's disease, we can't fix it. We don't have a cure at this time. We have some things that can help, and we'll talk more about those a little bit later, but we can't fix the problem in Alzheimer's disease. We often think about memory loss, and, and I work in a memory clinic, but it's a lot, we say memory because that's the thing people are familiar with, the thing people think of, but lots of things are affected other than just memory. People have trouble using gadgets, they have trouble with language and all sorts of other things. But often, especially in Alzheimer's disease, memory is the most um, noticeable early symptom. So what are some risk factors for Alzheimer's disease? And in many cases, for some other types of dementia, like vascular disease, vascular dementia. Well, first of all, age. The older we get, the more likely we are to develop dementia. About 10% of people we see with dementia are under the age of 65. The youngest person I have ever seen with Alzheimer's disease, and this was many years ago, this was a man who died at the age of 37. And at autopsy, we found that he had had Alzheimer's disease. Now, that was very exceptional. Um, but we see a lot of people in their early 60s. We see plenty of people in their 50s and occasionally people in their 40s with Alzheimer's disease. But it does get more common as we age. Previous head injury seems to be a risk factor for the development of Alzheimer's disease. So that's a, a significant head injury with loss of consciousness. And the more head injuries you have, the worse. So if you're young, try not to get head injuries. They're not good for the brain. High blood pressure is a risk factor for dementia. And so if you have high, you know, get your blood pressure checked. If you have high blood pressure, have it diagnosed and treat it because that may help to lower your risk of developing dementia later. Increased cholesterol is also a risk factor. Smoking is a risk factor. So if you smoke, please quit. It's a risk factor for lots of other things too. Um, being overweight is a risk factor for dementia. Being physically inactive is a risk factor. Diabetes is a risk factor. Having had a stroke or other blood vessel disease is a risk factor. And you may notice that this last several I've gone through are very similar to the risk factors for heart disease and stroke. So there's an interesting uh, connection there that a lot of the things that are risk factors for vascular disease, that is stroke and heart disease, are also risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. Um, the more education you have, that seems to be protective against Alzheimer's disease. So the less education you get when you're young, the, um, the more likely you are to develop Alzheimer's disease as you get older. So obviously, if you're, if you're 60 now, it's a bit late. This applies more to, to in your youth. People with Down syndrome develop Alzheimer's changes at a very young age. A history of depression seems to be a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, and we're not really sure why that is. Um, is it the depression that causes the later development of Alzheimer's disease? Is it something to do with the medications used to treat it? Is it just that people are somehow born with this predisposition to have depression and also to have Alzheimer's disease? Lots of research going on. We don't really understand that. Poor hearing seems to be a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease that's being increasingly recognized in recent years. And so if you're not hearing well, get your hearing checked and get hearing aid or whatever is needed to improve it. Um, and it's not just that you can't remember things you can't hear. It really seems that there is a link between poor hearing and developing Alzheimer's disease. Genetics. 
Alzheimer's is not a strongly hereditary disease. You know, one of the clinics I do is for people with Huntington's disease. In Huntington's disease, if a parent has it, you have a 50-50 chance of inheriting the disease. It's generally not like that in Alzheimer's disease. If you have a lot of people with Alzheimer's in your family, you're a bit more likely to develop it. But um, it's, you know, it's certainly not, oh, my father had Alzheimer's disease, therefore I'm going to get Alzheimer's disease. It's by no means like that. Um, and then there's a, a protein in our blood called apolipoprotein E. And this is something that shuttles lipids and fats, cholesterol around the body. And there are four different types we can have. We can have ApoE, one, two, three, or four. And if we have two, we get one copy from our mom, one copy from our dad. And if we have two copies of apolipoprotein E4, we have a much higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease than if we have uh, no copies of four. If we have, say, two copies of two, that's a much better, much lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. And that's something that they, they do on 23andMe. If any of you have done 23andMe, they tell you your APOE status, whether you're at increased risk of developing Alzheimer's or not. Again, you can be ApoE4 homozygous, meaning that both of them are ApoE4, both of your genes, uh, and not get Alzheimer's disease. You can live to be 95 and not develop it. Similarly, you can not have ApoE4s and still get Alzheimer's disease. So all of these things are risk factors. It doesn't mean that if you have high blood pressure, you're going to get Alzheimer's disease. It just means that you're a bit more likely to get Alzheimer's disease than the next person who doesn't have that risk factor. There are lots of different ways of staging Alzheimer's disease. And you know, when you read some of the stages, they talk about stage one looks like this, 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 and this. Stage two is like this. And if you think about your family member, you often say, well, gee, she's got these things from stage one, but she's got these things from stage two, and she even has these from stage three. So it's often not terribly helpful to, to use those stages. I, I, I'm not a big fan of them. I tend to think of Alzheimer's as being early, when people are still fairly functional, but they have some problems with cognition, middle, when they need more help, late, when they need a lot of help, and then end of life, which is very late in the illness when people are, are um, uh, close to death. Let's talk about some other forms of dementia. So earlier I mentioned vascular dementia. So this is disease. Vascular means blood vessels. So it means dementia that's due to a problem with blood vessels. So a person may have had multiple strokes. So a stroke happens when a blood vessel is blocked and that part of the brain is, is doesn't get any oxygen and basically dies. And you can see how if you're having multiple strokes, large ones or small ones, that's going to have an effect over time on your cognition and you're going to develop problems. Sometimes people may not have had a frank stroke that they've recognized, but when we look at their brains, we see that there's a lot of problems in the small blood vessels deep in the brain that tends to affect the white matter, which is connecting all the different parts of the brain. And that also can cause vascular dementia. Often, vas you know, Alzheimer's disease tends to be very gradual in its onset. Vascular dementia often is more sudden, which makes sense because if someone has a stroke, the problem may start more suddenly. And they may have a kind of step-like uh, progression. So they're okay, they have a stroke, they have some problems with cognition, they stay the same or even improve a bit over time as they recover from the stroke, but they have another one and they take another step down. And then they stay the same for a while or improve a bit and then another step down. So you see, when you see that step-like progression rather than a gradual progression, that makes you think about vascular dementia. Risk factors for vascular dementia, well, rather similar to a lot of the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, age, and then vascular risk factors, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking, heart disease, physical inactivity, a lot of those things. Frontotemporal dementia is another um, form of dementia that's not uncommon. <clears throat> and this affects the, the frontal lobes, the part of the brain that really controls our behavior, tells us what we should do and what we shouldn't do and how we should do it. And also the front part of the temporal lobes, which is not so much language, uh, I mean, sorry, which is not so much memory as in Alzheimer's disease, which is kind of the inside part of the temporal lobes, but uh, language. So if we have frontal lobe problems, we can have changes in emotions, changes in personality, changes in executive function, judgment, 
language. And so people with frontal lobe problems tend often present with things like a loss of empathy. They just don't care much about the people in their life anymore. They don't really, and this often occurs at a younger age than people with Alzheimer's. So we often see people in their 50s with frontotemporal dementia. They sometimes still have kids at home and they often kind of lose interest in kids. Um, they also, because they have their frontal lobes are not telling them how to regulate their behavior, they do things they wouldn't have done before. So they may, you know, people who never swore in their life suddenly start using profanity all the time. I remember one patient years ago who'd been uh, banned from a local shopping mall because he, um, he would make sexual comments to the women who worked in the shops, which was something he had never done before. This was a drastic change. Um, and so those are some of the sort of changes that we see in frontal lobe problems. When language is affected, there are a couple of different ways that language can be affected, and I won't get into all the details, uh, but those are some of the things that we look for in uh, frontotemporal dementia. Lewy body dementia. This is, uh, Lewy bodies are little proteins that accumulate in the nerve cells within the brain. And we see them in Lewy body dementia. We also see them in a different part of the brain in Parkinson's disease. So there are some commonalities between Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's disease. Some of the things we tend to see in Lewy body dementia that we don't tend to see <coughs> in other forms of dementia are a lot of fluctuations in cognition and alertness. So someone with Alzheimer's disease can have, you know, a bit of a bad day or a good day. <clears throat> but people with Lewy body dementia, they, you know, at 10 a.m., they may just be like a bump on a log. They're hardly even responding. But by 1 p.m., they almost seem like their old self. And you wonder, gee, is there really anything wrong? So you see these changes through the day. People with Lewy body disease also present with visual hallucinations. Often it's children or animals that they see. Uh, sometimes they know they're not real. Uh, and so I always have to ask about that. This may sound like a silly question, but do you ever see things that aren't really there? And often they say, yeah, how did you know? Um, sometimes they think they are real. I remember one lady years ago, her daughter went over one morning and she had all these blankets on her kitchen floor. And she said, what are all the blankets for? And she said, oh, it was for those little girls that were sleeping here. And of course, there were no little girls, but uh, she was seeing them. I mentioned that Lewy body disease has some things in common with Parkinson's disease. So we sometimes see the stiffness and slowness of Parkinson's disease in people with Lewy body disease. Unfortunately, in Parkinson's disease, medications tend to help a lot with those issues. In Lewy body disease, they sometimes help a bit, but they're not nearly as successful in improving the, uh, the motor symptoms as they are in Parkinson's disease. And they also, unfortunately, sometimes make the hallucinations worse. So it's something that we, if we try them, we really have to go into it with an open mind. Uh, they have trouble with walking, they have trouble with falls. Interestingly, Lewy body disease, and Parkinson's disease may be preceded by something called REM sleep behavior disorder. And this is something that's more common in men. It may go on for years or even decades before they develop the illness. And what that is, is that they're acting out their dreams. So we're in REM sleep, we're supposed to be paralyzed. That's when we dream, our eyes are moving, but the rest of our body is paralyzed. In REM sleep behavior disorder, people are dreaming, they're in REM sleep, but they're not paralyzed. So they're acting out their dreams and often they're violent dreams where they're fighting. They may even uh, hit their, their bed partner. And I, I remember I saw one uh, woman who had a broken arm because her uh, boyfriend had attacked her in his sleep. And, and I said, wow, you must really love this guy <laughs> because he, he, she came in with a cast on. And of course he felt horrible because he, he was doing it in his sleep. So, I mean, that's an extreme example. Most people don't break people's arms. I remember one gentleman who, um, he fell asleep watching TV and he had a dream that robbers had broken into his house and he was fighting them. And when he woke up, his big screen TV was on top of him on the floor and there was glass everywhere. He had attacked his television in his sleep. Usually it's not quite that um, uh, dramatic. It's usually just a lot of moving around during dreaming as if they're having a fight or something or running. And, and 
we can see more than one problem. So we often call that mixed dementia. And the most common type is a mixture of Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, where both things are going on. The person has had strokes, but they also have Alzheimer's pathology. Um, we can see a combination of Alzheimer's and Lewy body disease. And so, you know, these things don't necessarily, they're, they're all relatively common and they don't necessarily occur in isolation. You'll often hear talk of mild cognitive impairment, or MCI for short, and this is not really dementia. This is when someone, especially an older person, has a bit of a decline in their cognitive abilities, but it really, you know, so they're maybe a bit forgetful, but they're still able to do everything they need to do. It makes no real difference to their daily life and independence. It's just a bit of a nuisance. If you follow people with MCI over the course of years, some of them stay the same. They don't get any worse. Some of them actually improve over the course of years, but people with MCI are at an increased risk of things getting worse and, develop, and developing a dementia, such as Alzheimer's disease or sometimes another form of dementia. <clears throat> and so when I see people with MCI, I tend to follow them every six months, see how they're doing. Are they still able to do all the things they, they need to do in their life because they are at risk for progressing to dementia? So we talked a bit about risk factors. A lot of those we can't change. We can't change our age. We can't change our genetics. We can't change our sex. And I should mention that women have an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease compared to men, although men seem to have more a higher risk of vascular dementia. Um, and it's not just that women live longer. Obviously, women have a greater life expectancy. So if this is an age-related disease, you'd expect more women to get it. Even age for age, women seem to have a higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Um, head injuries, I mentioned, and other medical conditions. And then we have lifestyle factors, things like smoking, uh, exercise, those kind of things, things that we can have a hand in lowering our risk of, of dementia. So if we want to reduce our risk of dementia, we can't eliminate it. I, I certainly see people who are high performance athletes who don't have high blood pressure, don't have diabetes, don't have anything. They're doing everything right. They're eating well uh, and they still develop dementia. So we can't guarantee that if you do everything right, you won't get it, but you can lower your risk. And if everyone does these things, the, the incidence of dementia will go down. So things that are good for the heart are good for the brain. I mentioned that a lot of the risk factors are in common between heart disease and dementia. <clears throat> and so things like exercise, not smoking, treating blood pressure, and so on are good. <clears throat> Physical activity is important. So get out, get some exercise. And you don't have to be a high performance athlete. Getting out for a walk is a good one. Social activity is also good for the brain. We know that social isolation seems to be a risk factor for dementia. And so just doing things with family and friends is good for the brain. <clears throat> and often, unfortunately, when people develop dementia, often friends, this doesn't always happen, but I often hear that friends are uncomfortable with it. They don't come around as much. So if you have a friend or relative who has a dementia, try to reach out to them, stay in touch with them because it's good for them. We saw so much trouble, you know, when COVID came along and everything was shut down and people couldn't socialize anymore. That was very hard on people with dementia. <clears throat> it's estimated that there are around 20,000 people in Saskatchewan right now with dementia. So that sounds like a pretty abstract number, but that's more than the population of Swift Current. That's a lot of people. If you took everyone with dementia and put them in one city, you've got a city that's larger than Swift Current. That's a lot of people. <clears throat> it's also estim estimated that every day, 10 more people are diagnosed with dementia. And a lot of surveys show that people don't have a lot of awareness of warning signs of dementia, except for memory loss. Everyone seems to know memory loss, but, but other ones beyond that, people often aren't um, familiar with. So let's talk about some of those. <clears throat> there are, we talk about 10 warning signs that may be associated with dementia. Now, not everyone who has one of these warning signs will turn out to be diagnosed with dementia. There are other things that can do it. <clears throat> These are often grouped together as ABCs, as abilities, behavior, and communication. And we won't go through all of these right now because we're going to talk about them more individually. <clears throat> the other thing about a warning sign, 
is it has to be a change. So for example, just yesterday, I was seeing a man who said he got uh, something for his house and it took him twice as long to, put, it took twice as long for him to put together as it would have. And I said, oh, and you're pretty handy. You would have been able to do that. And he said, no, even 10 years ago, I, it would have taken me twice as long as anyone else to put together. I'm not handy. Okay, well, that's not necessarily a sign of a dementia if, it's, if that's the way he's always been. Um, People often used to ask me about a certain leader of a country, whether he might have frontotemporal dementia. And <clears throat> I, I would always say, first of all, I don't get into trying to diagnose people that I've never even met. But secondly, that by all accounts, the person they were talking about had always been like that, always been kind of obnoxious and, and fly off the cuff and foul mouth and everything. And so it wasn't a change. So if someone's always been like that, then we don't consider that a, a sign of dementia. <clears throat> so some of the examples, so memory loss, so asking questions over again. So you just had a conversation with your mother and she phones you back 10 minutes later and asks you the same things that you just talked about. Forgetting things that were recently learned, uh, repeating things. So again, your dad tells you something and five minutes later, he tells you the same story, not realizing that he just told it to you. Difficulty performing familiar tasks. So not being sure in what order to do things, forgetting sequences of things that used to be second nature, having trouble using tools or gadgets. So for someone who used to be very handy and now has trouble putting things together, um, someone who can't remember how to use the microwave when they've used the same microwave for a couple of years, trouble using the remote controls to watch television and things like that, those, those may be warning signs. Disorientation in time and space. So getting lost. I mean, if you live in a small town and you come into Saskatoon and get lost, that's forgivable. I mean, that happens. It's a bigger city. Uh, I would get lost in Hong Kong or New York. Um, but if it's a familiar area and the person is now lost, that, that may be a sign that there's a problem. Forgetting how to get home from a place that you've been to before. And, and difficulty with concepts of time, like getting up in the middle of the night and thinking it's morning, or um, you know, putting on a parka when it's summertime outside, those kind of things. Misplacing things, and often this can be traced back to a problem with memory. So forgetting where things are, uh, putting things in odd places, you know, putting the milk in the cupboard. And we all do things like that once in a while. You know, if you've once put the milk in the cupboard, it doesn't mean, oh my God, you have dementia. But if you're doing these things all the time, it suggests that there may be a problem. Um, sometimes people, because they keep losing things, they put them in really special places, and then they forget that special place and they can't find them, and then start to get suspicious. I keep losing things, therefore someone must be stealing them. And so, you know, they accuse their grandchildren or their nieces or nephews of taking things from them, when in fact they were the ones who put them somewhere and don't know where they are. Problems with judgment, which we can see in Alzheimer's, but particularly a problem in frontotemporal dementia where people are bad at making decisions um, or they may not recognize that something is a problem or have poor judgment with money. And unfortunately, we often see people with dementia or with mild cognitive impairment being preyed upon by scam artists who, uh, who steal their money. And so certainly something to watch out for. Changes in personality, mood and behavior. So very mood swings uh, for no apparent reason, you know, something very small, just sends someone right off the handle with anger, um, confusion, suspicion, paranoia, thinking people are conspiring against her or something like that. Being impolite, you know, and if you were never polite, you're not suddenly gonna get polite, but if you were a polite person and now you're impolite to people, that may be a sign of a problem. Or using harsh language or foul language that's out of character. I mean, if you always use swear words, that's not a change. But if you never did, and now all of a sudden you do, that may be a sign of a change. Loss of initiative. So people may just become uninterested in things they used to be interested in. They just, I don't really feel like knitting anymore. How come? Oh, I don't know. I just don't feel like it. Or they don't like to go out and socialize. Um, they, they don't start doing things. Or they may require prompts, you know. So, um, you know, here is your toothbrush. You know, now you can brush your teeth. But they don't go and do it themselves. 
problems with language. So trouble thinking of words, uh, saying wrong words, words that aren't even real words sometimes, and, and trouble understanding what other people are saying or uh, difficulty reading. Those can also be warning signs. Problems with abstract thinking. So trouble with calculating, with reading the time on a clock, um, with drawing things um, or understanding symbols, those kind of things. So those sort of abstract things can be an issue. So if you see those warnings, like why is it good to get an early diagnosis? Well, first of all, we can you can then have some understanding of what's going on, why your loved one, for example, is, is having these issues to, to rule out treatable causes. So I mentioned some things earlier, like vitamin B12 deficiency, thyroid disease, other things like that, that sometimes can cause uh, or can mimic uh, a dementia and that can maybe treatable. Unfortunately, those are not as common as I wish they were. You know, most often um, we, we di diagnose a dementia. We don't find something that's totally fixable. Um, to access resources and support, such as the Alzheimer's Society, um, to prepare and plan for the future. So if you have a very early dementia that's just starting to cause problems, that's a very good time to make sure you've done things, like make sure your will is in order, that you have power of attorney or things like that. Even better if you have only mild cognitive impairment and you're still doing very well, then is a good time to make sure you've got all those things in place, to make sure your family understand what your wishes are about your own health care if you can no longer make those decisions. And even better, if you don't have any cognitive problems, it's good to think about those things. We all should be doing those things to you know, make a will, um, have healthcare directives, documents for power of attorney and so on. Um, and in getting an early diagnosis, you can also think about things you can do to improve. So the things I talked about earlier to try and reduce your risk of dementia also <clears throat> have an effect in reducing the progression of dementia. So exercise, socialization, those kind of things are all, are all good for people with dementia and good for those of us who don't have dementia to try and help prevent it. In getting a diagnosis, it's not just a simple test. You don't just do a blood test and say, oh, you have dementia. It's a, it's a bit of a process. So you know, if you have a concern, go see your family doctor or nurse practitioner. They'll take a history. They'll do an examination. They may do a cognitive screening test, like a mini mental, for example, is a commonly used test out of 30. The MOCA is another one. Um, <clears throat> some laboratory tests, some brain imaging. In some cases, neuropsychological assessment is necessary, especially in kind of borderline cases, either where we're not sure there's a definite problem, or we're not sure which definite problem it, it, we're looking at. And you don't necessarily need to be seeing a specialist. There are specialists like neurologists, geriatricians, geriatric psychiatrists who diagnose and, and treat people with dementia. <clears throat> but there are so many people out there with dementia, it's perfectly valid for a family doctor to make that diagnosis. Most family doctors are comfortable making a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or other dementias. If it's something a little bit unusual, if it's a younger person or there's some unusual features, they may well make a referral to a specialist. Um, but um, a family doctor or nurse practitioner is a very good place to start. So when you talk, and, and the question I often get is, you know, my family member, I think that he or she might have a dementia, but they won't go see the doctor. What can I do? Well, one thing you could do is talk to that person's doctor. If it's your doctor as well, that's helpful. But you could call the doctor or make an appointment to see the doctor to talk about your family member. Because in Alzheimer's disease, early on anyway, all the social niceties are there. You can have a nice chat about the weather with someone with Alzheimer's disease and not even realize there's a problem. It's only when you come to something where you realize that they don't even know what, what year it is or what month it is or something like that or where they are or who you are that you realize there's a problem. Similarly, if someone's seeing his or her doctor for 10 minutes to get their blood pressure checked and talk about their medications, the doctor may not notice that there's a problem either. So, But if you talk to the doctor and say, this is what I've been seeing, that you know, puts that in the doctor's head so that when he or she sees your loved one the next time, they can bring up some of these things and ask the person about it and do some, you know, do something like a mini mental or that sort of thing. So 
write down the things that you're concerned about. And if you go, and it's always good to go with the person. So if you're concerned about your mother, for example, go with her to the doctor because you get so much more information talking to a family member than you do talking to the person herself. Because often the person herself doesn't even realize there's much of a problem, but the family member, the husband, the wife, the son, the daughter says, oh yes, there's, there's definitely a problem. How long has it been coming on over? And what I always hear is it's been really bad in the past six months, but I'm always, I always like to hear when did it start? So when was the first, the last time that she was normal? You know, was, was she having trouble last Christmas of 2021 with, you know, with recipes or something like that? Or was he having problems in the summer of 2020 because you remember that episode that happened? So think back to when, when was this person last normal? When, when did I not have any concerns in retrospect? You want to make sure the doctor knows the medications, uh, both prescription and over-the-counter, because some over-the-counter medications like sleep medications, um, antihistamines are not all that great for memory. So it's important to talk about those as well. Psychiatric history, family history. So those are some of the things to, to be armed with when you go see the doctor. <clears throat> Treatments for dementia. Well, first of all, education. I think people benefit from knowing what the diagnosis is, finding out more about it. That's what you're all doing tonight, learning a little bit more about dementia. Um, to get support for the person with dementia and their family and caregivers. Um, if you're not already following a healthy lifestyle, including things like exercise, to start doing that. And to think about medications. Medications, several studies have shown that medications for memory and so on don't really help in MCI. That's why we follow people, because when these things start to decline, that's when we would start a medication, but they generally don't help MCI. Uh, and these medications can help with cognition and help to maintain independence. So right now we have uh, four medications that may be helpful, denepazil, rivastigmine, galantamine, and memantine. And they treat the symptoms. They don't cure the disease. They don't stop the disease from progressing. But they may, in many people, in fact, in most people we try it, they can be helpful. Sometimes they don't help. Sometimes they help a little. And sometimes they help quite dramatically. So they're always worth a try, as long as there are no medical contraindications. And your doctor will look at that. There are certain heart conditions, for example, where we shouldn't use some of these medications. Um, and sometimes there can be some side effects of the medications, although most people tolerate them very well. Some people get a lot of stomach upset or diarrhea, so that's possible. I, I thought I'd say a few words about lecanemab because it's been in the news recently. It was recently approved in the United States and given the, the trade name Lecembi. And this is an antibody against amyloid. So I mentioned earlier this protein that gets deposited in the brain is called amyloid and has been for a long time been central to the idea of what causes Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so this is an antibody that helps get rid of amyloid. It's given intravenously every two weeks and it was studied for 18 months in people with mild cognitive impairment and early Alzheimer's disease. They had to have proof that they had amyloid on the, in their brain, either by doing a lumbar puncture or a spinal tap, that is putting a needle in their back to take out some spinal fluid, or doing an amyloid PET scan, which is not very available. We do have a PET scanner in Saskatoon, but we don't have access to amyloid PET. So right away, these are fancy tests that are not necessarily generally available. What they found is that was there was 30% less decline over 18 months in some cognitive tests. So basically after 18 months of getting this medication intravenously every two weeks, you were, had progressed about as much as you would have over say about 13 months. So not dramatic, but a step in the right direction. About 13% of people develop brain swelling or bleeding in their brain. And therefore you have to do frequent MRI scans on people while they're taking this medication. Uh, and it's approved in the USA. The, the cost in the US seems to be set from what I can see at about $26,500 per year. So it's very expensive. It's still under review by Health Canada. Um, it seems to be a step in the right direction. It's hardly the, the magic bullet that we're waiting for. There are problems with this brain swelling, brain bleeding, and the efficacy is not tremendous. So the other thing we don't know is what happens after 18 months. Is that all we get? And then 
things just get worse and go back to the way they would have been? Do you have to keep giving it or have you gotten enough amyloid out after 18 months? We don't really know the answers to those questions. So this is pretty new. The results were just announced in November. It's already been approved in the US. I don't know what's gonna happen in Canada, but um, if I were faced with it, I'm not sure I uh, have an extra $26,500 lying around that I could uh, that I could use to pay for this uh, if I needed it. So when you get a diagnosis from your doctor, now what? Well, get in touch with the Alzheimer's Society. When I make a diagnosis, I usually say to people, I have some little forms I can send to the Alzheimer's Society, ask them to give you a call. Would you like me to do that? And most people say yes. Uh, but if your doctor doesn't do that, you can email them, you can phone them and get in touch. And, and they're a really good resource. They, I mean, that's who's putting on this, uh, this talk tonight. Um, but they do lots of educational sessions regularly. They um, provide lots of support. There are support groups and so on. Planning for the future, and I mentioned about that. Driving is a big one. Um, as physicians, when we diagnose someone with a dementia, we're legally required to notify SGI in this province. Um, what changes do you need to make to your living environment? So uh, that ends my part. We're going to have questions in a few moments, uh, but I'll turn things back over to Erica for a little while. Thank you, Dr. Kirk. That was an amazing presentation. I hope you all feel more confident in your knowledge around dementia after hearing Dr. Kirk's presentation. We will soon be answering questions from the Q&A box, uh, so if you haven't typed your <laughs> questions in, we encourage you to enter them now and I will give you some more information on the Alzheimer's Society while you are doing that. So the vision of the Alzheimer's Society is to live in a world without Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. And the mission is to empower all people to live well with dementia while funding research into prevention, cures, and quality of life through advocacy and awareness. With Alzheimer's Society resource centers across Saskatchewan in the 20. 2021-2022 fiscal year, we served 2,400 individuals from 300 communities across Saskatchewan. I want to note a couple things. A person does not need a formal diagnosis to be connected with us, and we support those affected by Alzheimer's disease and other dementias and have resources and knowledge about many types of dementia. So what uh, can clients expect from the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan? First, individualized connection and service. So we provide individual information and support available both for people living with dementia and their care partners. Also learning opportunities, which include the learning series courses to help people with dementia, their families and friends to live as well as possible with the disease. The courses are offered built, build upon each other, uh, <laughs> each other covering the continuum of the disease. And we also have the evenings of education, which are standalone topics presented by content experts. Next, we offer connections, such as support groups. The Alzheimer's Society support groups offer a chance to exchange information with others li living with and affected by dementia, access the most current information, learn and share practical tips for coping and change, decrease feelings of loneliness and isolation, express feelings and be reassured that those feelings are normal, and find a sense of hope. We also have Minds in Motion, which is a two-hour weekly program that combines physical activity and social activity for those with early stage dementia and a friend, family member, or care partner. We also provide connection to other organizations. This includes providing information on available services provided in the Saskatchewan Health Authority, other government agencies, and lists of private or community-based organizations that help support people's dementia journey. Our shift to also offering virtual and online programming has increased our ability to provide additional programs to our communities. If you have any questions about dementia or need someone to talk to, call the province-wide dementia helpline phone number that is listed on the screen, which is available Monday to Friday between 8.30 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. 
So let's briefly talk about dementia research. The key to progress lie in investing in dementia research, revealing the mysteries of the disease and advancing diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. All research stimulates hope for the best life. The Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan funds research in partnership with the Alzheimer's Societies across Canada through the Alzheimer's Society Research Program. The Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan depends on the expertise of the Alzheimer's Society Research Program to allocate research dollars to innovate peer-reviewed projects that focus on finding treatments, cures, and causes, as well as improving the quality of life for people living with dementia. The Alzheimer's Society Research Program is Canada's most innovative hub for dementia research, helping the best and brightest minds in the field spark new ideas and transfer them into impact for people. We also offer research grants, which can be funded through four different types of grant opportunities. The first being proof of concept grants. This supports investigators with innovative approaches and projects with potential high risk and high yield. The second is the new investigator operating grant, which supports new investig investigators within the first four years of their faculty position. Third, we have the Doctoral Fellowship Awards. This supports trainees within the first 18 months of completing their PhD program. And lastly, the Doctoral Awards, which are intended to support students in the first 18 months of their PhD program. Did you know that every three out of four dollars of the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan re we receive comes from donations? Donations inspire hope to provide early diagnosis and greater awareness efforts for new medications and treatments and to provide strategies for coping, to provide care for partners in the confidence of their in their abilities and to continue to serve Saskatchewan communities with support and resources that are reflective of their individual needs. Donations come in during events as sponsorships, gifts left in will, monthly donations, or as general donations to the society. So now we will get to our questions for Dr. Kirk. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Erica. I'm excited about this because we have some excellent questions here. I, I, I like these. Uh, so let me just run through them. Some of them will be quick. Some might take longer. So we've got one here. Will a doctor use one method to diagnose or would they do multiple tests? So <clears throat> there would be some blood tests. It would be some neuroimaging, a CT scan or an MRI of the brain. And what I, I suspecting you may be referring to cognitive tests, you know, like the mini mental or the mocha or things like that. I think it depends on the doctor. Um, I've been doing this for over 30 years. And so often by the time I've finished talking to the person, I'm starting to have a pretty good idea what diagnosis I'm looking at. Um, that's not always the case. And sometimes we need to do uh, more cognitive testing or refer to a neuropsychologist for testing. Um, someone said, what if they don't have a family doctor? Yeah, well, that's a heartbreaking question. It's a big problem right now. Um, it's hard to find one. The College of Physicians and Surgeons has a list of doctors in your area who are accepting patients, but it's small these days. Um, I guess all I can say is talk to your MLA. Uh, tell them you don't have a family doctor and we need more doctors in this province. Why is education a risk factor? Okay, let me clarify that. It's lack of education that's a risk factor. So the less education you have, the more likely you are to develop dementia. And the more education you have, the less likely you are to develop dementia. Now, I've certainly seen people with PhDs, um, you know, university professors and people like that who have lots of education and who develop dementia. So again, it's a risk factor. Uh, lots of education seems to be protective, and it may be because you've built up more connections in the brain that you have more what we call cognitive reserve. Um, so there's, if you're trying to get your kid to go to university or college, there's uh, something you can tell them. If you get more education, you'll be less likely to get dementia. They won't care because that's 50 years down the road, but you can still say it. Um, where does cerebral amyloid angiopathy fit into the different types of dementia is another question we have here. Um, yeah, and I mentioned earlier, we're talking about some of the most common types of dementia. Cerebral amyloid angiopathy is a condition that 
it has an interesting relationship to Alzheimer's disease because they both have to do with amyloid, but it's a slightly different size of amyloid protein in Alzheimer's disease and in amyloid angiopathy. Uh, the two sometimes coexist. Sometimes people have both Alzheimer's disease and amyloid angiopathy. And amyloid angiopathy can cause cognitive problems on its own without there being Alzheimer's disease as well. It can also cause bleeding in the brain. And it can also cause um, episodes, transient episodes of weakness or, or other sorts of dysfunction. So it's a less common, a much less common cause of cognitive problems. But I, I didn't mean for the types of dementia we, we mentioned to be exhaustive. Someone asked, is it possible to accurately diagnose someone with Alzheimer's when they have paranoid schizophrenia for 35 years? Yeah, and that's often a hard one. Um, people with longstanding mental illness um, often have um, some cognitive issues. And if I come into the picture 35 years down the road, it can be very hard to be sure what's new and what's old. Uh, and, and it is an extra wrinkle in making a diagnosis. And sometimes it requires some follow-up to see if things change. Uh, but yeah, that can be hard. Someone asks, what are some symptoms of end-of-life dementia? Well, in the very, what I often say to students and residents is that in the very late stages, um, all dementias kind of look the same. They all sort of converge towards someone who is bedridden, uh, who can't walk anymore, who's not very good at swallowing, um, and who is susceptible to things like pneumonia and things like that. So those are the very end stages of the illness when someone is, is, is really profound, has a profound dementia. Is there a possibility that someone with dementia could lose their vision? Is vision loss ever associated with dementia? Yes, and that's a, a fascinating question. Uh, so for example, there's an unusual variant of Alzheimer's disease called posterior cortical atrophy, where instead of it being the temporal lobes that are mostly affected, it's the occipital lobes. And I remember, remember on that picture I showed you earlier, um, I showed you the occipital lobes at the back that have to do with vision. So there, people have trouble reading, they have trouble um, figuring out what things are. I have one patient with this condition who, um, she went to um, Haida Gwaii out on the, uh, or also known as the Queen Charlotte Islands where they have the totem poles and you have to go with a guide. And this was a bucket list thing for her and her husband and she had posterior cortical atrophy. And when she explained to the guide uh, that she had this problem. You're not allowed to touch the totem poles. You're only allowed to look at them. But the guide let her touch the totem poles because she had so much trouble understanding what she was seeing. Um, so that's an unusual type of Alzheimer's disease, but we certainly see it. People with that condition, often um, it stays visual for quite some time before they start to develop other problems. Um, is there a specific type of thyroid condition, hyper or hypo? It's usually hypothyroidism, low thyroid, that, uh, that may mimic dementia, cause some cognitive problems. Someone asks, what is the average time that Alzheimer's progresses from early to final? Well, I can give you an average, but averages don't always mean much because no one is really average. So from diagnosis to end of life, an average is about seven years, but I've seen people where it's been one or two years, and I've seen people where it's been close to 20 years. So it, it really, it depends on a person's overall state of health. It depends on their age. Um, it depends on a lot of things. And everyone would like to know, well, what exactly am I going to be like in six months, in one year, in two years? And everyone is different. Some people, things progress very quickly. Sometimes they progress very slowly. Sometimes we see plateaus. So I mentioned that these dementias are progressive, but sometimes people can stay the same, seem to be much the same for a good long period of time, six months, a year, a year and a half. Um, someone asked, does a person with dementia know they have dementia? Yeah, it depends on the person. Um, some people are painfully aware of the problems that they're having, and some people are completely unaware of it, especially people with the behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia. I tell them they have a disease. It totally, it's like water off a duck's back. They don't get it, although the, uh, the family gets it. 
Um, so yeah, it varies from person to person. Some people are very aware. Some people are not aware of the problem. Um, someone asked, will an MRI scan tell you what type of dementia a person has? It, it's one piece of information. Um, you can't just look at an MRI scan and say this person has Alzheimer's or this person has frontotemporal dementia, but putting it together with other information, it can be very helpful. Um, there's a lot, see our brains get to their biggest size at around the age of 25, and then they start to shrink for the rest of our lives. So if any of you listening to that are under 25, your brain is still getting bigger and better. If you're over 25, you're like me, I'm, I'm a little bit over 25, um, my brain is shrinking. And there's a lot of normal variation in how much a person's brain shrinks. So sometimes when I'm looking at the scans of someone in clinic, the person I'm diagnosing as being normal may have a slightly smaller brain than the person I'm diagnosing with early Alzheimer's disease. There's that much variation. <laughs> someone asked, how would I see a specialist? Start with your family doctor. You may not need a specialist. The, the family doctor may be able to handle things, but um, <clears throat> if not, that's certainly the person, the family doctor and nurse practitioner. And if you don't have one, go back to that earlier one. Let your MLA know, I don't have a family doctor. Please do something. Um, is dementia guaranteed to prog be progressive or it might hit plateau? Um, yeah, and as I mentioned, we can see plateau. So overall, it's progressive, but sometimes things plateau. We see that especially in vascular dementia, where people may be the same for a while, but then have a decline. But we do see it in other conditions like Alzheimer's, where things don't change much for a while. Um, how do you help a parent who has been diagnosed with vascular dementia, but who won't accept the diagnosis they've been given? Yeah, it's hard. Um, I don't think you have to hammer them over the head with the diagnosis. Uh, especially if they forget it and they don't remember it and the next time. Um, you know, that's a hard one. I think just um, telling them that, you know, you have some memory problems. You saw the doctor and she suggested this or that. Um, you know, your memory is not what it used to be. Um, but some people are very aware of the problem. Some people are not. Some people are aware of it, but don't want to admit that they have a problem. Um, it was mentioned that concerns could and should be shared with the physician. Yeah, what about sharing some of the personality changes and other warning signs prior to the visit? Yeah, uh, and they say, my mother pretty much locked her way through and came off as pretty much good. I was in disbelief. Yeah, we certainly see that where uh, people get lucky and get the right answers. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think let the, let the family doctor or nurse practitioner know in advance if possible. Um, and if I can just ask Joanne, who's quickly erasing these questions, if you can just wait till I finish answering them because then I sometimes forget part of the question before I'm done, <laughs> thanks very much. But it is good to have them disappear so new ones come up. Um, how do I encourage my mom, who is my dad's full-time caregiver, <clears throat> that it's important to also care for herself? Yeah, um, <clears throat> that's a big one. Um, you know, if a, a person with Alzheimer's, especially as they get into the middle stages, needs a caregiver who is going to help, um, and that's just so important, but the caregiver is can become burnt out. So, you know, if you're a family member of someone who's a caregiver for someone with dementia, First thing I could say is try and help them out. Uh, you know, get them whatever professional help they have. Give them a rest. You know, say I can look after dad for a while if that's feasible. I mean, it's not always. Um, you know, um, those are some of the things that can be helpful. And if you are a caregiver with someone with dementia, for someone with dementia, it's also important to care for yourself. I mean, we see caregivers of people with dementia end up in hospital with a stroke or something like that. And all of a sudden, it's a big problem because, you know, the husband with, with dementia was managing because his wife was doing well, but now she's in hospital with a stroke. What's going to happen to him? So yeah, it's really, um, it's really hard. And another part of that same question is, how do I suggest to my siblings to meet dad where he is and not argue with him about his current reality by correcting him? Yeah, um, some people say connect, don't correct. Um, yeah, you don't have to hammer people over the head and say, no, you're wrong about that, dad. It is Thursday today. Um, 
you know, it, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, and if you get something wrong and it's not that important, I mean, if it's important, yes, you have a doctor's appointment this afternoon that you have to go to. Sometimes you do have to correct him. But um, yeah, it, you know, people should know that, um, first of all, it's important to know that people aren't, people aren't doing this on purpose. They're not, they're not asking you for the 10th time in the past two hours the same question just to irritate you. They really don't remember that they already asked that question nine times or they wouldn't be asking it. So it's easy to lose your patience and get, I've already told you that 10 times. Um, <laughs> just trying to be, uh, to be patient is the important thing. Um, and, and we don't have to hammer people over the head with, you got this wrong. Um, do all types of dementia cause patients to forget who family members are? Yeah, in many types of dementia, in the very late stages, people will forget, and in some forms in earlier stages. Uh, so that doesn't, um, doesn't always happen. Um, and even in the late stages, I see people who still smile when they see their family members. You know, they may not be able to say their name, but they still know, you know, that's my spouse or something like that, or that's my daughter, that's my son. Um, are there effects from anesthetic on someone with dementia? Yeah, so um, someone who has dementia, who um, uh, goes through an operative procedure is more likely to develop a delirium, to be more confused than the next person. So it's important for the surgeon, the anesthetist, and so on to know that someone has dementia. It doesn't mean they should never have surgery. I mean, if they need it, especially in an emergency, they, they need it. Um, and I've seen plenty of people who've had their hips replaced and things like that, and they've done just fine. And generally, the more advanced the dementia, the greater the effect of, of having an operation, having an anesthetic and so on. Um, modern anesthetics are pretty good, but, but people uh, can sometimes have problems. So I think if it's something elective, like having a hip replaced, probably better to do it sooner rather than later, better to be doing that in the earliest stages of a dementia. Now, of course, again, the wait list can be long and that comes back to talk to your MLA kind of thing, right? Um, what else do we have here? Let's see what other questions we have. Um, yeah, someone says, my mom has dementia. She's forgetting she has to go to the bathroom, then says she doesn't know why the chair is wet. Um, and that question just jumped. Okay, there it is. Um, or she says a dog came into her house. Is this a later stage? Yeah, it depends. It you know, incontinence can be a late stage of dementia. In some people, it can be an earlier problem. In some conditions, like normal pressure hydrocephalus, which we didn't talk about, that can be a very early symptom. Um, and uh, or saying that a dog came into her house. Well, people with Lewy body disease, that can happen very early, seeing animals or children or things like that. And in Alzheimer's, hallucinations, if they ever happen, would tend to be a later thing, not so much early. Um, okay, what else have we got here? Uh, my mother refuses to go for medical care. Um, refuses to go to the doctor. She's past early stage dementia. Yeah, I um, I hear that even anecdotally from friends and acquaintances. You know, someone says, oh yeah, my mother has dementia, but she won't go to the doctor. I, I think it's important to get a diagnosis and to, and to get what care. I mean, we don't have a cure, but there are certainly things we can try for people with dementia. Um, and it's hard. Uh, talk to her doctor if she's got other health issues that she sees her doctor about. If you talk, as I mentioned earlier, if you talk to her doctor um, in advance, he might then know when he's seeing about her blood pressure or her arthritis or something that you're concerned about her memory or other cognitive issues and, and test that, whereas he might he or she might not have uh, previously. So I, I think talking to their doctor, assuming they have a doctor. Um, Okay, let's see what else we've got here. Um, uh, my mom is 91. Had to, well, the longer ones take me longer to digest and, and see what to say. Um, 
Yeah, my mother, my mom is 91 and has dementia, but most of the time functions well. I speak with her every day on the phone, and I often wonder how to properly properly respond when she mentions something like my deceased father having been with her, or that she thinks my sisters are with her, but they aren't. Uh, should I correct her or should I not? <clears throat> I think if it doesn't really matter in the moment, you don't have to correct her. If she says, oh, your dad's out in the backyard or something, and, and you know, in fact, your father's been deceased for five years, you don't have to correct her and say, but he's dead. You know, it's, <clears throat> you know, that, again, it, it's just sort of like I was saying earlier about some other things. You don't have to hit people over the head with the information. Uh, sometimes it's comforting for people to think that that person is around somewhere. Um, so it, yeah, I, I think trying to be gentle, um, sometimes it's necessary to correct them, you know, where really, uh, you know, where, where is my husband? Why isn't he here and everything? You know, sometimes you do have to explain things to them, but I think generally um, <clears throat> correcting the person is probably best avoided. Um, so let's see here, what else do we have? I can't answer all of these because we we don't have a lot of time left. Uh, but let me see. Try to pick out some really good ones here. Um, oh, there's an interesting one. This one takes me back. Someone said, "Are there any studies with choline as a supplement that can help the brain of those experiencing mild Alzheimer's?" Yeah. So I mentioned that. Maybe I didn't mention it, but the medications that we use increase the amount of acetylcholine in the brain. And choline is one of the things that's important for making acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is low in the brain in Alzheimer's disease. So back in the 1970s, and actually when I was in first year medical school, I did a project about this. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that was tried was giving people choline. Um, to see if flooding them with choline might help increase the amount of acetylcholine in their brains. Kind of like what we do for Parkinson's disease, where we give DOPA to try and increase the amount of um, dopamine in their brains. Unfortunately, it didn't really work. And uh, it, in many cases, it made them smell kind of fishy. So people were, were avoiding them when they were taking high doses of choline. So that's why the next stage was trying to use medications that's, that slow the breakdown of acetylcholine so that there's more acetylcholine in the brain. And that's how most of those medications that I mentioned earlier work. Um, okay, uh, someone said, when talking with a parent who has Lewy body dementia, oh, I lost it, I scrolled too far here, and vascular dementia that is progressing quickly, should you be careful what you talk about, limit what you tell them? Um, I think use your own judgment. Again, I keep using this phrase, hitting them over the head with things. You don't have to hit people over the head with, you know, your, your life expectancy is limited by this disease. Um, you know, a lot of people with dementia are very good at living in the moment because they, they don't remember a lot of things from the past. They don't maybe think about the future and they live in the moment. And isn't that what we're all supposed to be doing? We keep hearing that we should live in the moment more. Uh, so I think if you can meet them in that moment, you don't necessarily have to talk, keep telling them, oh, you have Lewy body dementia, you know, things are gonna get worse, you're gonna have more problems. Um, you know that, I'm not sure it really helps to be, to be forcing that information on them all the time. Um, yeah, what is the life expectancy of someone diagnosed with vascular dementia? Again, that varies even more than Alzheimer's disease because if a person with vascular dementia uh, gets on the right uh, treatment that helps to reduce the risk of stroke in future, they may do extremely well. On the other hand, if they have a condition that doesn't respond well to treatment, it may progress very quickly. So again, averages aren't terribly helpful. It's just so different. And I have people with vascular dementia who have stayed the same in a plateau for four or five years at a time and really not progressed any. So it, it just depends on the patient. Um, someone's asked, uh, in the case of MCI, <clears throat> is the diagnosing physician required to report to SGI? Yes, as physicians, we are required to notify SGI when we diagnose someone with dementia. 
Some doctors forget to do that. I've certainly seen it happen. You know, I, I, I'm seeing people with dementia all day, every day. And so it's, you know, I, all, I always mention that, I always send it in. But if you're a family doctor, it may not click in the moment when you're, you know, you're making that diagnosis, you're talking to people about something that you don't do as often uh, as someone who's doing this all the time, and you may forget to do it. <laughs> but the physician is required to report. Just because someone has dementia doesn't mean they have to stop driving. Um, it's only when um, their dementia is far enough advanced that it's likely to impair their driving, or as the question asker has asked here, when their driving ability is demonstrably impaired. So SGI looks at the medical information. Uh, sometimes they'll test people if they're not sure. Um, and uh, and um, so, you know, they, they base it on whatever evidence they have. And they're not perfect, but they try to balance the safety of that person and other people on the, uh, on, and the safety of other people who are out on the road. Um, let's see, what else have we got here? Uh, can clinical psychology and counseling help to find and teach coping mechanisms to reduce anger outbursts or improve or prevent mood swings? Yeah, to some extent, especially in early dementia, it may be helpful. Um, so yeah, sometimes um, psychology can be helpful. Um, I see a long one here, so I'm just gonna read through it and see what it says here. Yeah, is there a benefit in preparing, I like this one, is there a benefit in preparing a list a favorite music specific to the person and having that made into a playlist <clears throat> so that they can listen to it on their iPod. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's great. I mean, I'm very much a music person. I, I'm into Spotify these days and I have a playlist called Great Stuff that I listen to. So if I'm ever in a condition where I can't do it myself, I hope someone will think of playing me my, my playlist. Um, yeah, so I mean, music is so important to so many of us, and there have been studies that shown that listening to music that people like can, you know, we we're just talking about reducing anger outbursts, can help with uh, emotional outbursts and things like that, can make them feel better. Um, and uh, I, I remember seeing a video of someone who was with dementia was very angry, and someone puts on a song that they really like, and within a couple of minutes, he's just calmed down and he's sitting listening to the song. So yeah, I think that's a great idea. And, and not just any music, but music they like. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Does Here's a good one. Does lack of sleep affect memory and do sleeping aids have any effect? Yeah, you know, we didn't talk much about that, but poor sleep is a risk factor for dementia as well, <clears throat> particularly sleep apnea. So it, you know, often when I'm seeing someone with memory problems, I'll ask, you know, I'll ask their partner, do they snore? Do they ever seem to stop breathing in their sleep? Because sleep apnea can certainly make a person very tired during the day and can affect their memory and so on. And sometimes people's lives are just transformed by starting to use CPAP for it. Um, and the other question is, do sleeping aids have any effect? Well, it's better if you can get by without sleeping aids. A lot of over you know how we talked a few minutes ago about how acetylcholine is low in the brain of someone with Alzheimer's disease? A lot of over-the-counter sleeping aids are very anticholinergic, so they're not a good choice for people who have uh, a dementia. So if you're having trouble sleeping, I, I really wouldn't recommend over-the-counter sleeping aids other than perhaps melatonin, which is fine. Um, which is not anticholinergic. Melatonin is fine. It may help people with sleep. It's not a strong medication, <clears throat> but it's a natural medication. And if it helps, great. If it doesn't, I would talk to your doctor. There are some other things, prescription medications that might that could be okay. Um, okay, let's see what else we've got here. Um, how important is the diagnosis of the type of dementia in regards to approaches of drug treatment? Yeah, well, it's important in several ways. So for example, we talked about some of these um, cholinesterase inhibitors, the drugs that increase acetylcholine. They can be helpful in Alzheimer's disease. They can be helpful in Lewy body dementia. They can often be helpful in vascular dementia, but they don't help in frontotemporal dementia because that, that low acetylcholine level is not 
present in frontotemporal dementia. So, and in fact, sometimes those medications can make people with frontotemporal dementia worse. <clears throat> How often should someone who's been diagnosed with dementia visit their specialist or doctor with respect to their diagnosis? I think various doctors do it differently. I Typically, I may see people more often at first, but typically I'll see people every six months and I'll tell them, but give me a call sooner if you have concerns. Um, and so I, I think it, and, and different doctors may manage that differently. Um, so I think it depends on the doctor. I, I would ask you, doctor, how often do you typically see people? Is dementia associated with decreased life expectancy? And the answer to that is yes. Um, if MCI has been the diagnosis for your family member, but they have warning signs of Alzheimer's, some quite alarming, when is that the step to support them as actually having Alzheimer's happen? So I think <clears throat> what you're saying is, yeah, someone's been diagnosed with MCI and you're seeing a lot of changes and thinking, I'm not sure this is MCI anymore. I think if you're seeing that, talk to the doctor. Um, one of the worst things that can happen, I'm following someone with MCI and they come to their appointment by themselves because they're still managing fairly well. And I'm not hearing from the family that they're, you know, they're losing their way, they're forgetting how to do things much more dramatically than when I saw them before. So it's always really helpful to have a family member involved. And um, so I, I think, yeah, um, go with them to the appointment or, or phone the doctor and tell him or her what you're seeing because uh, it's important to see that. Um, okay, and then here's another interesting question. It says, we've been working with a team for a diagnosis for my loved one. In the various appointments with different healthcare providers, we have heard frontal lobe, vascular, Alzheimer's, and then one saying it's not Alzheimer's. How can we get some certainty? Yeah, the only certainty in diagnosing someone with a, a particular type of dementia is at autopsy, when you actually look at the brain under the microscope. That's when you can say this is 100% for sure Alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal or whatever. And so <clears throat> sometimes um, different physicians may interpret things differently and make a different diagnosis and say, you know, this looks like vascular to me, or another physician may say it looks more like Alzheimer's, or another say, may say it looks like mixed. I think there's a component of both. Um, most of the time, the diagnosis that we make is correct, but it's not always. We know from autopsy studies that sometimes someone who uh, really looked like they had Lewy body disease at autopsy, you see that they, in fact, was Alzheimer's disease or vice versa. And so <clears throat> it's not perfect. We don't, it's not like um, say a cancer where you do a biopsy and, the, and they look at it under the microscope and say, yep, yeah, this is cancer and this is what kind of cancer it is. So we aren't always 100% sure. And in fact, the terminology that's used is probable Alzheimer's disease. Um, and sometimes at different stages of the illness, things may look a bit different. So the doctor seeing the patient, first of all, uh, you know, there may be some memory issues and they say, this looks like Alzheimer's, but a year later, um, seeing that patient, it may be more apparent that in fact, the way it's developed, it's now, lo it's really looking more like frontotemporal. So it's, uh, it's hard. Um, there was a mention of four different drugs used to treat symptoms of dementia. Um, are different drugs used for different dementias? Yeah, well, we don't use those drugs that I mentioned in frontotemporal dementia because they don't help, as I just mentioned. Um, <clears throat> different doctors often prefer a different one of the medications. Memantine or Ebixa is not terribly helpful early in the illness. That's for more advanced people, whereas the other ones can be helpful very early and we usually start them when we make the diagnosis of dementia, but they don't help during MCI. So <clears throat> there's that sort of catch 22. We wanna make a diagnosis early, but the medications don't help MCI. You have to actually get into early dementia before the medications help. Um, <clears throat> and for vascular Lewy body, and Alzheimer's disease, those first three medications that were mentioned, any one of them could be tried. They have different side effect profiles and so on. And sometimes if someone doesn't tolerate one of them, <clears throat> we might try another one. Um, 
What percentage of 90 year olds get dementia? Well, quite a few. The Canadian study of health and aging, which I think is one of the best studies, shows that one in three people over the age of 85 has some form of dementia. So it's a lot. Um, there's another question about sleep. I think we've talked about that. Um, someone says, my mom is 95 years old with beginning Alzheimer's signs. Would Aricep be of benefit to her? It may well be. I mean, it depends. <clears throat> you want to make a diagnosis. Um, you want to make sure she doesn't have any reasons why she shouldn't be using it. So for example, there are some findings on ECG that mean that it's not a good idea because it may slow her heart down. Um, so um, yeah, I, I, I would talk to the doctor about that. Is this something for her? Is this a good idea? Um, what else? Where is the best place to financially support research? I respect the society and the match protons. Yeah, the also I think the Alzheimer's Society is a good place to support research. They give out grants to researchers uh, at at the provincial and at the national level. I think I think that they are a very good place to uh, to donate your money to if you want to uh, uh, if you want to support research. <clears throat> um, let's see. I'm just, I can't answer all of them, so I'm trying to pick ones that I think are going to be a lot of general interest. Um, someone says, what if your dad has um, CLL cancer? I'm assuming that's chronic lymphocytic leukemia and stage four dementia, and they could do treatment. Would you think treatment would be some? So I, th I think you're asking if someone has an advanced dementia, should you be treating their cancer? I think that's a very individual question. Um, you know, if someone has a very early dementia and has a good quality of life and the cancer has a good um, a good chance of, of going into remission if it's treated, that's one thing. If someone has very advanced dementia and is bedridden um, and the cancer may well not respond to treatment anyway, uh, I mean, that's a, that may be a different kettle of fish. It's a, it, this is a very individual question. I think it's something to talk to, to the doctor, to talk to the person, to talk to the family about. Um, can your family doctor prescribe any of the four drugs mentioned earlier? Yes, there are no restrictions on who can prescribe these and plenty of family doctors prescribe these medications. Uh, sometimes I get referred patients who are already on one of these medications, sometimes not. Um, Let's see, what else? Um, what is your advice for families of loved ones living with dementia that have a positive outcome during their loved one's hospitalization? So I'm assuming that means a person who has a dementia and now they go into hospital for something. Well, I think, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, tell the healthcare team about their dementia. It's important that they know going into it, you know, that this person has a dementia and what kind it is. Uh, because they'll be careful about some of the medications they use and things like that. Um, visit them as much as you're able to. So it really makes a difference having someone familiar there. If you, you know, if you have an advanced dementia and you're in hospital, you might think you're in jail. You, you don't really understand what's going on. So having um, having someone that you know and someone that you love there is uh, is very helpful. Um, Let's see. Does someone with Alzheimer's speak more quietly? Not usually. Uh, people with Parkinson's disease tend to speak more quietly, and, and some people with Lewy body dementia may speak more quietly. Uh, not typically in Alzheimer's, but there are lots of, uh, lots of different things. Um, someone uh, ta asked about 23andMe, saying, um, as a young person in, in my 30s and knowing there's a history of dementia in my family, how much investment should I make into the results of these tests? Uh, yeah, so if you, let's say you go do, do 23andMe and it tells you, yeah, you have two copies of, uh, of apolipoprotein E4, therefore you have a higher risk of dementia than the next person. Well, first of all, it's kind of upset. And there was a news story about a famous actor whose name escapes me right now, who just recently got that um, information that he had two copies of Epsilon 4. I'm sure some of you out there will remember. It was just about a month ago, and I'm not up on my actors, so I can't remember who it was. But um, 
anyway, it was in the news recently. So first of all, um, there isn't anything special or different that you can do knowing that you have that. All the things that are good for you, that are good for everybody are important. Maybe knowing you have that, it would be more of an incentive to make sure you keep a close eye on your blood pressure, your blood sugars, that you exercise, that you eat well. Mediterranean diet is the kind of, usually the kind of diet that's most recommended as being good uh, to help lower the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so if it served that incentive, then it, it might be um, helpful. But there isn't a med right now in 2023, there isn't a medication or something or a particular vitamin or herb that we can take that will prevent us, whether we have apolipoprotein E4 or not. All the things that are good for everybody are good for those people. So I, I, all I can say is if you had two copies of apolipoprotein E4 and you knew that, it might be kind of an incentive to, to do those things. Um, yeah, uh, someone asked, can the medications that I mentioned be helpful um, in the middle to late stages of the disease or only early? <clears throat> well, um, I mentioned that memantine is only sort of in the middle and late stages. Is it helpful? It really doesn't help significantly in the early stages. So we usually hold off on that one. Uh, the others, we start them as early as we make a diagnosis, and they can be beneficial all the way through. Sometimes in the late stages, we can find that those anticholinergic medications may increase agitation in some people. So sometimes we will reduce them or stop them late in the illness, but if that's not a problem, we often will continue them all the way through. Um, Let's see. I'm just going through. We're getting close to the end. I'm trying to find the, the, the highest yield questions. Um, someone's asked, is Lewy body dementia the only form where per, uh, people see people who aren't there? <clears throat> no, it's very, very common in Lewy body dementia but we can see it sometimes in other forms like vascular or Alzheimer's disease. It's not as common, but it, but it does happen. We do see that. And, and, some, and, and we don't usually treat the hallucinations in Lewy body or other forms of dementia if they're not disturbing. If someone says, yeah, I see these kids, but it doesn't really bother me. Or, you know, and, and they're even if, especially if they're aware they're not real, but even if they think they're real, but they don't really bother them, or they look out in the backyard and they see a dog that's not really there, we don't necessarily put people on medications for that. We, um, uh, we only treat them if they're becoming disturbing, you know, if they think that the, I had a patient recently who, who was seeing demons dancing around her bed, and obviously that was very disturbing, and so we used some medication for that. And the, the questioner said here, we call these waking dreams. I think that's excellent, because I think that's what they are. Um, I talked earlier about how people with Lewy body dementia may have REM sleep behavior disorder, which is a condition where they're asleep and dreaming and yet they're not paralyzed, they're, they're moving around. Um, I think that what's happening in these hallucinations in Lewy body dementia is that these people are awake and yet they're dreaming. They're seeing these things that are uh, what they should normally be seeing during dreams. So I think it's a disturbance of, of sleep-wake. Um, <clears throat> let's see, I'm just looking uh, here. Yeah, there's a couple of questions about hearing loss as a risk factor for dementia. Yeah, so it's, um, yeah, and, and, and the, que the question here has said that it's not just that the person doesn't hear and misses things. So obviously, if you don't hear something, you can't remember it. So sometimes if you have poor hearing, <clears throat> it can look like you have memory problems, but it's more than that. It's now increasingly recognized that having poor hearing is, a, in fact, a risk factor for dementia. We really don't understand why that's the case. Is it because, you know, we know that social interaction is good for the brain and helps reduce risk of dementia. Is it because people who can't hear tend to not be as socially involved, and that's why it's a risk factor for dementia? Um, 
it, it's really, and this is fairly new, it's really only in the past few years that hearing loss has been recognized as a risk factor for dementia. And, and it's really not well understood yet. I, you know, ask me again in 10 or 15 years and we'll probably have better answers to that question. Um, let's see. Someone asked, um, are hallucinations just visual or can they also be auditory? Yeah, they're most often visual. Again, Lewy body is the one where, where visual hallucinations are very common. Sometimes they can be auditory. <clears throat> That's much less common. Sometimes they, uh, and I've only seen this once, sometimes they can even be tactile, meaning feeling. So I had a patient what who often had the feeling that a dog or cat had just brushed by his leg and he would look and there was nothing there. So they can be in other modalities other than just visual. Um, so um, yeah, we can see other types of, uh, of hallucinations as well. Uh, someone's asked, how is a diagnosis of Korsakoff's disease related to Alzheimer's disease? <clears throat> well, Korsakoff's is a different illness. It's related to a deficiency of thiamine. Um, we, we see it in people who are very poorly nourished, often in people who are heavy drinkers, who get low on thiamine and they develop a memory problem. Korsakoff's is mostly just a problem with memory rather than all of the other things that we see in Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. So I've zipped through a lot of questions there. I'm sorry if I haven't answered your question. I'm sure it was a good one. I tried to... Um, uh, zip through them. I see there are lots I wasn't able to get to, but Erica has reappeared, and I think that's a clue that we're getting very close to the end. So perhaps what I'll do now is turn things back over to Erica. Thank you, Dr. Kirk, and thank you everyone for your amazing questions. If he didn't have time to answer your questions, you can give us a call on the Dementia Helpline at one 949 4141 and hopefully we can answer your questions at a later time. So I want to thank everyone who attended tonight. Your support and commitment to educating yourself on the, yourself on dementia means a lot to your community. Thank you again to Dr. Kirk for your presentation and to Connexus Credit Union as our sponsor. And thank you to the team at the Alzheimer's Society who worked hard behind the scenes tonight to make this presentation run smoothly. So if you have any further questions, please give us a call and watch your inboxes for additional resources and information. Thank you, good night.